Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon to all you folks out there that will be receiving this DVD later on. It's good to be able to join you wherever you are and, and be listening to this DVD. And hopefully you are observing a Sabbath service somewhere and maybe be using it in that capacity. I've been watching the news now for quite some time. Once I came into God's church, and that's been over 40-some years, they told us to watch. And so I used to do that, and I think more as I get older, I'm watching even more. When I was a young man, I could not see a lot of change in the world. Everything was going along pretty much the way it always had. But as I got older and I began to see there's a drastic change taking place in this world today, uh, particularly in the Middle East and also in our country. But I don't think our people in the United States and Britain and the English-speaking countries, I don't think they even see it. They just sort of go along with what's happening. I noticed the other day that uh, Alabama is now going to be taking licenses for gay marriages. And I heard a couple of interviews from some of the Supreme Court justices. You know, that's going to be a decision that they're going to have to render. And according to some of the clues that they gave, I suspect that they're going to okay gay marriage throughout the United States of America. So to us, we know what the Bible says. But to our fellow Americans, it's just oh hum, okay business as usual. Just as long as you don't take my paycheck, don't take my food stamps, don't take whatever it is that I've got, don't be messing with me, everything's going to be all right. Another thing that I've noticed is our attitude toward the Middle East. At one time we were very friendly to Israel because they were our one friend over there in that country. But now we have taken, or the administration has taken, uh, a different posture on dealing with Israel. It's almost an adversarial position. And as we're taking that position, and as the present administration does not want to get involved in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Iran, in Yemen, in Libya, they, they realize what's happening, but not to the extent that the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that in the end, there's going to be a king of the south that's going to push at the king of the north. And at that time, World War III is going to break out. Now, what I'm beginning to see is that the king of the uh, south is beginning to come together. David was inspired to write about it in the Psalms, about this confederation of uh, Middle East nations that are going to come together, and of course, they're going to try to destroy the United States of America and Israel. And they've already said that's their goal. They call us the great Satan and the little Satan, Israel, and their goal is to kill us to destroy us off the face of the earth. Their goal is to uh, instill a Sharia law and uh, worship Allah and their prophet Muhammad. And it seems that they are headed in that direction. The United States is making a superficial attempt to stop ISIS or ISIL, but they aren't. And they almost attacked and overrun one of our uh, centers where we had 300 Marines the other day. They helped train uh, some of the uh, Muslims over there. And uh, I think it was just a, a test to see how far they could go. But at any rate, prophecy is being fulfilled. I can see it. I've lived through it. I've been watching. I've come to the point that I can see What's happening in our country is our morals are they're on a downhill slide. I mean, some of the things you see on television, some of the commercials, and uh, just the commercials, that's available to everyone, to our children. Um, but when you go to the HBO, which we don't have, and uh, Showtime and all those other stations, every now and then they'll show a commercial down on our cable of some of the shows up there, and it's one murder right after the other. It's adultery and fornication and um, sexuality. It's just prevalent throughout the United States. And it's just accepted. It's being accepted. I remember the words that Clark Gable said in Gone with the Wind. 
first curse word I'd ever heard in the theater. And when he told Scarlett, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And you could hear a, the whole theater, ooh, you know. But now, that's one of the least things they say. They take God's name in vain. They use the F word. It's accepted. So, having said that, I wanted to talk to God's people today about something that's very important and very significant in these times. And the scriptures tell us that in these days, as in the days of Noah, as it was, that every imagination of man's heart is going to be wicked. And we know that because of that, God destroyed them. God's a patient God. Our ministers have been speaking about that sermon after sermon after sermon, giving the qualities of God and how God is merciful, how he's kind, how he loves us. We know that. But that time is coming that God's going to say enough is enough. Let the righteous remain righteous, and those that are unrighteous remain unrighteous. We read about in the last book of uh, Revelation. So there's going to come a time of reckoning. Now, they don't think that anything's going to happen to them because there's no direct, immediate punishment. You know, any child that can get away with something is going to get away with it. I've been in stores where the mother or the father would say, do you want a spanking? Well, the child doesn't want a spanking, but they don't spank him. They don't do anything. So the child continues to act out. And they'll say, I'm going to spank you when I get you home. And you know, and the child knows, they're never going to get any punishment whatsoever. Well, that's the way we are as human beings. If we're not punished immediately for the transgression, and that's what's happening with capital punishment. They don't do it anymore. We've become more righteous than God. We've just decided that that's cruel and unusual punishment to put a murderer to death. So we put him in prison, feed him, give him television, uh, fine clothes, take care of his medical uh, needs for the rest of his life. And so that's the world that we live in. So having said that, I want to take you back to John, the first chapter. John, the first chapter. I think you'll see where I'm going when we move along. In John 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, what does that tell you? It tells you that was the beginning of something. But we heard recently in one of our sermons that God has always been there. He and Christ as God, the Elohim. Which means two. Those two beings have always existed. So at some point in time, there was a beginning of when God created the heavens and the earth and created uh, time and created human beings, and uh, there was a beginning there. But as far as God is concerned, there never was a beginning. But the two beings was the Word, which is Christ, and the Father. And they're both gods, members of the God family. <laughs> The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Well, we know that looking at other scriptures, it was Christ that did the creating. The Father told him what to do, but Christ did the creating. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Christ has, has life in him, and life is symbolic here of light. So when we talk about light, we're talking about the truth. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Therefore was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Well, we know that all men are going to believe, but each in his own order, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15. Not everyone is going to come to understand it all at once. God has a plan. He's going to reveal it in part to certain ones throughout the ages. He was not that light, talking about John the Baptist, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, Christ, which lights every man that comes into the world. And no man can be saved except through Christ. So it is only through Christ that you can receive eternal life. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. 
But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So those that received him, those that accept him, he can give life to. And we know today that the majority of mankind hasn't believed on him. They haven't received him. They haven't accepted. So they don't have eternal life waiting on them as of yet. But only a few do. A very few. That's the elect. Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So can it be any clearer that the word was Christ, and Christ was born from the Virgin Mary, and was born into this world and became flesh, flesh and blood. And later on, he was going to die for us. Now this word, this God being that became flesh, came to this earth for a reason. First of all, we know that he came to die for mankind because all had sinned and fell short of the glory of God. But also we realize that there are a few that he's going to call along the way. And he's going to open their minds to his truth, to his plan of salvation. And he said over in 1 Peter 2, 21, he came in the flesh to set us an example as how we should live. He says, I have set you an example that you should follow in my footsteps. So Christ lived, what, 33 and a half years? And he had disciples and he taught them. But he also, we have in the Bible here, this words written in red letter that Christ actually spoke. And he instructed those disciples, and those disciples were inspired to write many of the things that he said down. So he gave us information. And that information came from Christ himself, God. But he came and also he says, I'm going to live and you watch me and you follow in my footsteps. In other words, I want you to do like I do. And the world's so confused, they get off track. They may start in his footsteps. I was walking through a flea market the other day and this fellow was an elderly fellow and he had some um, poems that sitting on a little table and I stopped to look at those poems. Actually, he stood up, and I guess he saw me looking at them, and he says, how about reading that one? Well, I read it. He was a pretty talented guy. In fact, at one time, he had a contract with a greeting card company, and he wrote those uh, poems for them that went in the greeting cards. But he is retired now. And, uh, he said, it gives me an opportunity to witness to people. So he wanted to witness to me. He said, I thought when I was a young man that I had received him, but he said, I never had received him unto myself. Well, I didn't have the heart to go and explain that he was very much deceived. So he thinks that he had received the Lord. I wanted to say, do you keep the Sabbath? Do you keep God's holy days? Have you repented of your sins? Have you been baptized? Have you had hands laid on you? I didn't have the heart to say that. I said, well, you're a very talented man. And so I moved on. So people have a, a way to get off track. It sounds good. Christ said they're going to come and they'll be preaching about me. And that's what most of the ministry of the world today. Almost any religious group or denomination, they'll preach about Christ. But they don't preach his message because they don't understand his message. So Christ says, follow in my footsteps. And he said that way is going to be straight and narrow. You can't deviate to the right or to the left. And you can't, as Miss Oprah Winfrey once said, as long as you get there, it doesn't matter how. I beg to disagree with Miss Winfrey. It does matter. The course you take that's off course, it says it's broad and wide is the way, and it leads to destruction. So there's only one way to get there, and that's through the Word, through what Christ said. In 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, 2 Timothy 3, Verses 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. So this, this book, the Bible, was given under God's inspiration to certain men. And you go back to the first five books of the Bible, it was Moses. 
And then you see Samuel and Joshua and all through the prophets. And then we read in the New Testament, uh, Paul and the uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, uh, James. All these men were inspired by God. So that's scripture. Now, I did have an email the other day from a fellow, and he says, 1 John 5, 7. He, I don't know if he's trying to trick me or if he wanted to know if I knew what was going on, but he says, is that a part of the Bible? That's where it says that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all at one, and they all agree. I said, no, that's not a part of the Bible. I said, part of that was added by an, an interpreter some time back. So you see, you have to know what the Bible says, and it has to be in agreement. The Bible doesn't teach a trinity, and we know that. But 1 John 5, 7 was written to try to force that into the Bible. So we have to know what scriptures were inspired, and occasionally an interpreter may put something in there that isn't exactly right. But all scripture that's true was given by the inspiration of God. Now, why did God give it? Notice what it says. It's given, it's profitable for doctrine. You know, some people don't even know what the doctrines of the church are. I didn't know when I was going to the Methodist church. I didn't know what the doctrines were. I didn't know if they had any doctrines. Didn't, didn't have any concept. But we know what the doctrines are. You read in he, Hebrews, the sixth chapter, and it begins and tells you what they are. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's what the Bible was written for. You see, because Christ wasn't going to live forever, he wasn't going to stay here forever, so he put it in writing for us, for us to read, and for us to understand it. Why? Next verse. That the man of God may be perfect, or become perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, we are to produce good works. That doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It's a process called conversion. Now, the Bible is the Word of God, and this is the most important book on the face of the earth, bestseller. And I wonder how many people actually read it. Yesterday, I went into a, a bookstore there in our local community called the Books A Million. That is one huge bookstore, row after row after row of books. And they have a section called Religious Section. And you walk back through that section, and there's not one book in a religious section that has the truth of God. All these religious leaders have written books on their philosophy, what they think. Um, they've written books on how you can lift yourself up and be really encouraged, lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. But none of them outline God's plan of salvation, not a one. They sell those books, you see. God's church doesn't sell books. We're not in it to make money. We give it away. We give it away because people give the tithes and offerings to support that so we can give it to people uh, that are searching for the truth that God is working with. So let's see what else it says about God's Word. In John, the sixth chapter, John 6, let's notice verse 63. It says, it is the Spirit that quickens. Now, just that statement alone, if you don't understand God's plan, if you don't understand Acts 2.38, if you don't understand Romans 8 and verse 9 that says, if you don't have God's Holy Spirit, you're not His. So you have to have God's Holy Spirit to be Christ. You have to have it. And you can't worship Him except with the help of the Holy Spirit. It says you worship him in spirit and in truth. You can't understand the truth without the spirit. So you have to have God's Holy Spirit, and you can't get that unless you repent and are baptized and have hands laid on you. Acts 2.38 says so. So it says here, it's the spirit that makes you alive. You have to have the spirit in you if you're going to live again. The flesh doesn't profit you anything. And a lot of people are living to the flesh. Now, I didn't watch it the other night, but I think they had some kind of awards called the Grammys. And believe me, those people were so enthused about those Grammys and that little old token that they would take home with them. And what they were really impressed with was who made your dress and how much you pay for your diamond rings and your necklaces and um, 
Where did you get it? And who designed your hair? They were really impressed with all that stuff. Those people today, one day will be just like the people that I grew up with, the Clark Gables, uh, Marilyn Monroe's. They're dead. So all those awards that they cared so much about are meaningless. They're sitting on a shelf somewhere, probably gathering dust, or a pond somewhere by their children. So the flesh profits you nothing. At the time, you may think it does, but believe me, it doesn't. The words, you see, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So Christ says, the words I'm telling you, you better listen to them. And you better follow in my footsteps and my example and do what I tell you to do. Because that's how you're going to inherit eternal life. Now going on reading through there, in verse 67, then said Jesus unto the twelve, will you also go away? Because what he told them was, and it's just like, if I had tried to tell that fella in the flea market about God's plan of salvation, he would not have understood it. He wouldn't have wanted to heard it. He would have rejected it because his mind wasn't open. And so some of these people that listened to what Christ said, they went away. What are you talking about? These words are life. You've got the words? No, we've got our church group. You know, we've got the truth over here. These Pharisees, these Sadducees, we've got, you know, the religion of the day, and we don't want to hear some new upstart coming in here bringing more stuff in here that could get us confused. And we don't want to get confused. So they left. And so Christ asked them, he says, are you going to go away too? Now notice what Peter said. Simon Peter answers the Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of the living God. They didn't have any doubt. They, they had been with him. They would seen some of the miracles that he had performed. And God was opening their mind. They didn't fully understand it yet because they hadn't received the Holy Spirit. But they understood that there was something different about this man. And they listened to him. And they were willing uh, to follow him. So going on to John 15, of verse 3, notice what it says about the Word. John 15, verse 3, it says, Now you are clean through the Word which I have spoken unto you. You see, it's God's Word that makes you clean. Now that's talking about your mind. It's not talking about your garments. It's talking about your mind, how you can be made clean, how you can become converted through God's Word. Isn't that what he uh, said back in, uh, to Timothy? When Paul wrote to him, it's to make you perfect. So it's God's word that cleanses us if we apply it. It's God's word. Notice Acts 13. I'm going to give you a few scriptures here just relating to the word and how the word affects us. Acts 13, notice 26. It says, Men and brethren, children of the stock of Abraham, and whosoever among you fears God, to you is the word of this salvation sent. The word first came to the Jews, but what we read in John, the first chapter, they rejected him. He said, this word first came to you, and this word is what leads to salvation. He said, this word is going to bring you life. That's what he said back in John 6. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and the rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. So even though the Jews had the prophets, they didn't understand the message, did not comprehend it. Now over in 2 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 4, see this is what I was alluding to at the beginning. The world that we live in today, it's becoming more and more complacent. People are just getting away from God. They don't, they don't have time. They're too busy with their schedule. They're trying to make money. They're trying to um, get ahead in the corporate world, and there's so many activities to do. And the Internet probably is one of the worst things in the world for people today because it consumes so much of their time. But Paul wrote to Timothy, and he says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, those that are alive, and those that are dead, that is appearing in his kingdom. He, he said, you preach the word. 
And you be instant in season, out of season. In other words, we don't have to, have to keep preach the word on God's holy days. We have to preach the word on the Sabbath. We have to reprove sometimes. And God's, you know, we don't ever look at somebody and say, now that, they need a sermon on that. I'm going to preach this specific sermon so that that particular individual will get this message. We don't do that. We read God's word, and if the shoe fits, you wear it. But that doesn't mean we're picking on you because we don't really know what individual problem you're faced with. We just know the problems we're faced with, and many times we read the scriptures to help us as, as ministers. But we're supposed to uh, reprove and uh, to rebuke, to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So that's what we're supposed to do. Because he says the time's going to come, and I believe we're already here, the time's going to come when they won't endure sound doctrine. Mr. Smith and I was mentioning today, where, I wonder, are all these people that we once knew in the world wide? There were thousands of them, at least, what, 150,000? I wonder where they all are. Well, some of them did, but I know a lot of them have left. Now, why? Why did they not endure? What was it took them away? I don't know. Where are they today? Why is it that we have such small groups? And why is it that one person may jump from one group to another? If they get offended in one group, they'll go look for another one. They go somewhere else. And then over a process of time, the longer you neglect the Sabbath, the neglect the holy days, the easier it is. As simple as that. So he tells us what to do. He says the time's going to come when they won't endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. So does that not look like the world we live in? And I don't know how it is in some of the other church groups. I hope that the people are enduring. I hope they're uh, faithful Sabbath keepers. I hope they are. But I don't know. I don't check up on them. It's not my business. And I don't know the condition of the various churches. I don't know if they have strife in the churches. I don't know if people are upset about what the preacher says, I don't, I don't know all that. But I do know what's happening in our country. And I know that people are, they don't want to mention God anymore. And even our government, if you try to mention God or if you try to pray, then you're violating somebody's rights. And they, they're trying to stop that. So if you can imagine and project on down the road, what do you think it's going to be like? The more people we bring in from other nations, with different ideologies, with different beliefs, worshiping a different God. I mean, at least when we founded this country, we said the word God, we knew what we was talking about. They may have thought you when you died, you went to heaven or went to hell, but we were talking about the same God. Now we're not. Now we have people that are praying to Allah, uh, people are praying to Buddha, and that's the way our country was founded, freedom of religion, so we give them the right to do that. But ha think about it. How can you assimilate all these different beliefs into one country and have unity. The more people that come in with the various beliefs, the stronger they get, the more they're going to push their beliefs on others. And that's what's happening to our country today. And our people are so complacent, they, they don't attend church like they should. And it's just that we are not a faithful country like we once were. And so we're going to pay the price for it. And they're not going to endure sound doctrine. I can see it happening. And it's possible that it's happening in God's church. And in fact, I know it is because Matthew 25 says that half of the church is going to fall. Half. So I don't know that maybe people are attending church services and are just occupying a seat. But you see, God says... These words that I give you, they are life. And just listening to the words is not enough. It's not the hearers, but the doers of that word. Because Christ said, follow my footsteps, follow my example. And Christ never once sinned. Now, none of us can do that perfectly, but certainly it's something we need to be striving for. Words, words of life, adherence to those words. It's like Peter said, where are we going to go? You're the only one that's teaching the truth. They understood that. Now, Acts 17, 11. This is a scripture that I learned. Many of you probably already know it. Acts 17, 11. Something that we in God's church should be doing. 
And it says, it's an example for us. There were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Now, if you receive the word, if you're excited about the word, and we were. I remember 40-some years ago when we first began having our minds open to God's plan of salvation and understanding that God would beget us and we could become children of God. I remember the zeal. My wife and I used to fight over the Good News magazine, the Tomorrow World's magazine. Who was going to read it first? Who was going to get, uh, you know, uh, to get to read the articles first? And uh, sometimes you, you'd almost read the whole magazine before you quit reading. Now, that's zeal. Now, 40-some years later, how do we feel? Some 50 years later, do we still have that same zeal, that same excitement over God's Word? Well, we know about the Sabbath, don't we? We know about His plan of salvation. We know about the Gospel. We understand about the seven resurrections of the Roman Empire. We understand about the tribulation. We understand about the seven seals. I mean, we know a lot, don't we? God's revealed an awful lot to us. So, I think I'll just skip it today. I was just thinking, you know, I already know that. The more you skip it, the quicker you're going to forget it. Because human beings just can't remember. I think of all the things you read, you only retain a small amount of it. You don't re remember it all. I'll read an article and sometimes I, I want to tell somebody what I read and I can't even remember the title. But it's up there. It's like all those articles Mr. Smith read. It's up there. <laughs> but he can't tell you word for word about all those articles. He'd be the first to tell you that. So these people search the scriptures every day. And if the minister stood up and told them something, they didn't just accept it. They looked it up in the Bible. You know, as we preach, we were always taught to take notes or listen intently. Some, you just make sure that what that minister is telling you is the truth. And if, if you just get so complacent that you say, oh, he wouldn't lie to us. He might. I've had people lie to me before. And I've I've known people that are heads of organizations that are not preaching the truth. And a lot of people have been so blind following them around that they just accept what they say. He wouldn't lie to us. Well, he might. He may be conf confused and deceived and be preaching something that he thinks is right but isn't. So you need to check it up. And it all has to fit into that plan. Remember, the Bible is like a puzzle. And every piece of that puzzle has to fit. And if you read something or, or you're taught something that doesn't fit in the puzzle, don't just accept it. Do like these Thessalonic, these people here, the Bereans, they search the scriptures to prove that it was so. And it says, prove all things, and then hold fast to what is good. And a lot of people are coming to the knowledge of the truth. And it's hard for them to accept. We had this one lady Oh, she was so enthusiastic about receiving the correspondence course. She received the first three lessons, and we must have gotten mixed up and didn't send her one of the lessons, and she called, and she wanted, she wanted that correspondence course. Well, we f followed up and sent it to her. It just happened to be lesson four on the Holy Spirit. And then it says, God is not a trinity. And it wasn't long before I got an email. Take me off your mailing list. You see, she did not receive the word. She didn't even... She could not get past the traditions that she had learned, what she had been taught. And when you receive the word really, that means you've got to believe what the Bible says. And if it says it, then Christ said these are the words of life. Now, I didn't want to accept what I was reading. I did not want to accept the Sabbath. It was a hindrance to me. It was in my way from accomplishing my life goal. I wanted to be a coach coaches coach on Friday nights. It got in my way. I didn't want to accept it. I tried every way in the world to get out of it. But every time I'd read that, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. <laughs>
I had to stop. I had to stop what I was doing and yield to that word because it was the truth. I couldn't prove it wrong. Oh, I tried to change the dates and the times. And I figured, well, Sunday, maybe Sunday, you know, maybe Sunday is a Sabbath. And you keep that on Saturday night till Sunday afternoon. You know, I tried to figure every way in the world. Couldn't get around it. God's word was the truth. So, began keeping the Sabbath. When we read back in Titus 1, it says, hold fast that word. Titus 1, verses 9 through 11. Hold fast the faithful word. Now, so I, I've given you several scriptures here about the word. I could go on and on and on, but that's not what I wanted to do. That's not my intent. In fact, I've spent too long now on that aspect of it. I want to take you back to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Now, here was a young man that God had called. He was a shepherd. But God called him. He was going to make him king. And that man is David. Now, David wrote the Psalms, of course, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because we just read that. So God is inspiring this man to write this. But God could work with this man, because David, as we read in the book of Acts, was a man after God's heart. David wanted to know the mind of God. He wanted to follow in Christ's footsteps. He wanted to do that. He, he didn't want to live the life like all the other people around him. He was one of the few that God was working with during that time because God was going to make him king over Israel in the millennium. When he returns, he had a purpose for this man. And this man yielded. He searched the scriptures. God inspired him. He knew the first five books of the Bible. He understood of what Moses had written. He understood that it was God's law. Notice what he said in verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. He said, blessed are they that keep his testimonies. Now, testimony is a, a, like you testify and something that's been said. So uh, he had heard this. Then he went on in verse 3. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes and laws. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all your commandments. See, this is a man who wanted to keep God's commandments. Now, did he slip? Did he make any mistakes? Absolutely. That's a matter of history as well. God didn't let him get away with that. But he did show that even though you make a mistake, you can repent of it. And God will forgive you for that. He says, if you're faithful, to confess your faults before me and sincerely mean it, I'll forgive you. And that's what he did with David. Now, notice verse 9, he says, Wherewithal or how shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to your word. So how do you change your carnal attitude? By following God's law. That's how a young man or a young woman cleanses their way. That's how you change by reading the words of life and apply them in your life. Now, everything you read, you're not going to like it because it's going to go against your desires, against your will. But God says you must do my will. And so once we read it, God expects us to make the changes. Now, it may take time. There's things, it may take 30, 40, 50 years. You read about some of the men that God worked with. How long did Abraham and Sarah have to wait on the child that God promised them? Well, they got tired of waiting, didn't they? They decided to take matters in their own hand. Now, look what that brought us. Look at the problems we've got with the Arab nations today through Ishmael. Well, they did it their way, and look what, what it cost. But it takes time. Sometimes it takes uh, uh, many, many years before God can accomplish what he wants to accomplish in our life. Look at Joseph. Sold into slavery, went into prison. Went in 13 years old, and then he was 30-some years old. He ended up becoming second in command to Pharaoh, but it wasn't easy. He got thrown in prison for several years. So God has a way of working it out, but you just have to uh, take God's word for what it says and apply it. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Do we search and seek God with our whole heart? Or is it just a ho-hum thing? <laughs> well, Sabbath service is tomorrow. Boy, I hope we can hurry up and get that over with so I can get you know, back to doing what I want to do. Is it something that's in the way? It shouldn't be. Well, I can't wait for Sabbath services. I look forward to meeting with our, our brothers and sisters in Christ and uh, having a meal with them and being able to spend the day 
that's the special time of the week for us. We'll look forward to it. And that's only the fourth commandment. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Have we come to the point where we actually have memorized certain scriptures? And when we start to do something, that scripture pops out in our minds. And, oh, that's like I was with the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. I couldn't break it. It got to the point where I just I couldn't do it. It was just consuming me inside. So I had God's word in my mind about the Sabbath day. And as a result of that, started keeping it, starting observing it. And as you go along, there's other things that you can do. We used to take God's word, certain scriptures, put them on an index card. You'd put the verse on one side and the scripture on the other side. Like uh, First Tim, what did we read back there about all scriptures given the inspiration of God? We remembered those. Acts 17, 11, Hebrews, the 11th chapter is the faith chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, the uh, resurrection chapter, uh, love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. We went through all that and we committed it to memory. Now, I must admit that my memory is fading today. It isn't what it used to be, but I know where to go to get it. And maybe I don't remember the exact scripture, but I can find it in a reference. So you commit God's word to your mind and when the situation arises it's there and you can apply it and you'll do it but it doesn't come easy with my lips have I declared all the judgments of your mouth I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches I will meditate think about these precepts and have respect unto your ways he thinks about them do you think about them during the course of a day you know I get up sometime two or three times a night to go to the restroom. When I come back, I may lay there an hour, and I'm thinking about God's law. And I say, will you stop it and go to sleep? I just I got my mind on something, and I may be thinking about a sermon. I may be thinking about some scriptures. I may be thinking about praying for somebody that's sick. And then maybe 30, 40 minutes to an hour, you look up, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, and, and you still got to get to sleep. But David says he did that. He said he, seven times a day he prayed. And uh, you've just got to think about it. You've got to replace our thoughts, as I think as Mr. Smith, so you bring, have to bring every thought into subjection. And that's what we have to do. So David loved God's law. Notice Psalm 119, verse 97. I, I would encourage you to read this whole, whole chapter. It's a long one, but boy, it's worth it. He says, oh, how I love I your law. It's my meditation all the day. You through your commandments have made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. You know, you're wiser than, wow, the administration in Washington, all the congressmen, you're wiser than all of them, and that doesn't take much, uh, some of the decisions that they make. But because you know God's truth, because you have instructions. You know, I used to, I would read Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer. I used to like to read books about horses, black beauty. I don't read any novels anymore. This is the only book that I can get the truth from. I mean, fictional, all these mysteries and so forth. What good's it going to do? It's usually written by some man who um, is a transgressor of God's law or some woman. Now the big, um, the big movie is Fifty Shades of Grey, and it's nothing but a cesspool for what I understand. And uh, people can't wait to watch it. You see, that's how I know where we're headed as a country. You through your commandments have made me wiser. I said that. I have more understanding than all my teachers. Psalm 101, I refrain my feet from every evil way that I might keep your word. Verse 104, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Notice what he says here, and I like the analogy he uses. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's like when you're walking through the forest at night. Sometimes it gets mighty dark, and those shadows kind of get spooky. But if you take a, a good light with you, you can find your way through. If you're not, you may come to the edge of a cliff and fall over. So he says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. In other words... It showed him how to live. It showed him how he would conduct his life. It, it was a light. It was a lamp. And that's what we should use as God's word to show us along this straight and narrow path that we're supposed to be following. 
The Bible is actually chock full of vital, life-giving in information. Uh, some of it's history. Some of it's reproof. Some of it's correction. Some of it's doctrine. We read about that. But 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, it says, all those things that happened, if you read about Moses, if you read about David, you read about Joseph, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he said, I gave you all those things as an example. So you won't make those mistakes. So that you will do what is right. Now, it's like a parent telling their child. After the parents have made the mistakes, and the child's going to do this, and you say, oh, don't do that, they don't think you know anything. They have all the answers. They're going to do it anyway, didn't you? When your parents told you not to do something, didn't you go ahead and do it? We did. We, we did it because we knew that we were right. And then you pay the price if you'd only listen to the parents. So if we would only watch and listen to the example of the Israelites, then we maybe would avoid a lot of catastrophes in our life. The, the Word of God is literally filled with instruction. There's an answer to every problem that we have. And it's not pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. It's being able. And I've thought of this, and our ministers have, have done a lot of making me think lately, Mr. Taylor, Mr. Smith, about God. And Mr. Smith, about how God is concerned with every little detail, everything. And so I can pray more about everything, about certain specifics that God's concerned about. And he doesn't answer all my prayers, but he's answered a lot of them. But sometimes it's taken many, many years before he does it. So you don't quit. You don't give up. You just keep reading the Word, keep studying the Word, keep applying the Word. You know, the Bible says, back in Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, it lists the Ten Commandments. David said, Oh, how love I thy law. So he loved those commandments. Jesus Christ himself said in Matthew 19, 17, if you enter into life, keep the commandments. Well, he already said the words I give you are life. So keeping the commandments is life. You have to. If you want to be in God's kingdom, you have to keep those commandments. Now, in Matthew 22, in Matthew 22, they came to Christ and they were trying to always trick him up. Boy, if they only knew who they were talking to. If they only knew, they were trying to trick the God who made their minds. He could read their minds. He could read their thoughts. He knew what they were thinking long before they did it. He understood every aspect of their life. So they came to him and they wanted to know which one of these laws are the greatest. Matthew 22, verse 36. And uh, Jesus said in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Which one was that? Well, it was a summary of the first four. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. If that's what I read. Now, I know people that will get so upset if you eat out on the Sabbath. They make their whole religion around that. I also know people who, if you don't observe certain days from the calendar, the new moons. It's very important to them. But what my Bible tells me, the whole law and all the prophets, no, the Old Testament revolves around what? These two commandments, which summarize the ten. Love toward God, love toward neighbor. If you can accomplish that, that's life. But it's not easy, is it, to keep the commandments? No, we struggle. Because it varies. You see, magnify the law and it goes in so many different directions. And it touches on every aspect of our life. Every aspect of it. Or God would have probably made 11 commandments if it was something else it didn't touch on. So he gave us 10. And when you magnify that law, it covers everything. So, when you look at this, he says, you love the Lord your God and you love your neighbor. Well, my next question is, what is love? They asked some little children on the St. Jude's commercial the other day. It was the cutest commercial I think I've ever seen. These poor little kids, many of them are fighting cancer. And they said, what is love? And one of them says, it's being able to walk. 
and they they went through several of them, but they didn't fully understand the concept, but to them, what love meant. But to us, what does love mean? Well, we read in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. So when you look at God's character, if God is love, and we read in 1 Corinthians 13 that love is very patient, very kind, never rude, never seeks it own, it always thinks the best. So that tells us about God's nature, doesn't it? He's very patient. Is he with us? Well, we all should probably be blotted out of the book of life if God acted the way, you know, he should, if he didn't have patience, if he wasn't merciful to us. But he is merciful, and he's kind, because God is love. And that's what Christ was telling these men, that's what you need to do. You need to develop that type of love, where you're very patient, you're very kind, you're never rude. When I read those scriptures, they just, I'm rude. I'm rude to people on the highways. I went through the other day, some guy run a stop sign, cut in front of me. I had some words to say. He went by and I was shaking my fist at him. My wife says, and look at you. Look at you. I said, yeah, look at me. <laughs> well, you know what? It went on during the course of the day. And I came to another stop sign. And here comes a woman with a cigarette in one hand and a cell phone in the other. She runs another stop sign. I won that battle. I just said, I kept my mouth shut. I said, have a good day, lady. And I hope you don't run any more stop signs and kill somebody. But I, I, I won that one because I had God's word in my mind that I was, can't be rude to people. It's tough. I'm telling you, this world we live in. I want to let them have it. As Mr. Taylor says, with a two before. <laughs> and maybe a two before would help sometimes. I don't know. But anyway, see, you don't know when it's coming. You think, well, I'm prepared. And I'll ask God, and I'll say, now, God, I've got you. Give me another day. Let me do better today than I did yesterday. It only took one stop sign. <laughs> and my prayer was not answered. But the next one, it was. I'm not saying that I won't ever do it again, but I'm going to try not to. I don't want to be rude because that's not God's nature. He's very kind to us. So God is love. Uh, we read about that in 1 John 4, 8. We read in 1 John 5, verses three and, uh, 2 and 3, this is the love of God that we keep the commandments. So you see, we've got to keep God's commandments. And that's love. That's what God is. So you see, what God did was look at his own personality, his own character, and he wrote it down. He said, now let me write this down for these knuckleheads so that they can understand it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I imagine the Father looked over at Christ and says, you think they can get that? Well, we haven't yet. They're still worshiping Allah and Buddha and um, Satan the devil. We're still worshiping the God of this world and his money. So all of us haven't gotten that yet. It was very simple. Now, God is God. There is no other. That's what he said. But we don't believe it. Well, some of us do. And I hope we all do. Because that's the one God that we're going to have to worship. So, we must keep his commandments. Now, when you come to Romans 13, now, I'm going to take you through a sequence here. Romans 13, notice what it says. When you look at God's law, and you look at God as love, and then Paul wrote this, Romans 13, what it says in verse 8, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. Isn't that what Christ said? Love your neighbor? Well, he says don't owe anybody anything. It's all you all do is love them. So, that should be simple enough, shouldn't it? Well, how do you love them? When he went on to explain by keeping the commandments, and he was talking about the last six, love toward neighbor. But then he said, in verse 10, love works no ill to his neighbor. Now, when I got upset with that man that run the stop sign, I worked ill toward him. I wasn't doing him any favors, the words I was saying. Now, I weren't cursing. I wasn't cursing or anything, but I certainly didn't think that he was doing me any good. Because he could have run into the side of my car and could have hurt me and tore up my car and things like that. But love works no ill 
Now look at what's going on in the world today. Do you think marriage between a man and a man and a woman and a woman is, is a good thing? Uh, I don't think so. Not according to God's Word. So they don't know it, but they're hurting themselves. They're hurting our country because God says it's an abomination. He won't tolerate it. Do you think abortion is good? Where a woman has the right to decide for herself whether she's going to kill her own child? Does that work in the to that little unborn child? Well, of course it is. So they don't love them, do they? Not according to this. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And we talk about love all the time. We give sermons about love. But God is love. God is the one who's perfect. And he tells us, follow in my footsteps. And he says, you are to love me or to love your neighbors. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians 13 what love is. He gives us certain basic principles. And I wanted to go through all these and, and uh, have scriptures on them, but I'm not going to have time. But I'm going to give you some of these you can write down and you look these up. One of the ways that we can show love toward our neighbors is control our mouths. James wrote a whole chapter on it about the tongue. And he says, you can control ships, but you can't control your own tongue. So we need to control our tongues. Do you think Christ would have said or done anything that um, would have hurt anybody else? Now, he was blunt. He confronted those who tried to trick him, but he still loved them, and he cared about them. So we need to control our, our own tongues, James, the third chapter. In Matthew 12, it says you're going to be judged by what you say. So we need to control our thoughts. We need to control our words. I gave a sermon sometime back by your words. You're going to be judged by those words because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So what you've got in here, if you don't have God's love up in there, just like that fellow went through the stop sign, my mouth opened up and things came out that shouldn't have. So you see, we've got to put it up there. It's got to be in there. Second thing, we need to control our thoughts. If you haven't listened to Mr. Smith's sermon on that sermon, you need to do so. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. Bring every thought under subjection, under control. Now, that isn't easy, believe me, to control your thoughts. Because sometimes thoughts pop into your mind and you say, where in the world did that come from? I don't want to think about that. But it's there. So you got to be able to maybe quote a scripture or uh, think about something that is good. Another thing, Matthew 7 says, and we in God's church have a tendency to do this. He says, judge not lest you be judged. He said, why don't you concentrate on taking that big, huge beam out of your own eye rather than trying to pull a little splinter out of your neighbors? It's so easy, it's so easy to see other people's faults. And we're so quick with our tongues to tell them so. If we see things that we don't like, um, that doesn't maybe fit into the way we look at things, it amazes me how quick so many people today on Facebook and Twitter and all these other things, they want to fo face, uh, force their opinions out. Who cares? Who cares what they think? I don't anymore. <laughs> I used to be worried about what people would think. I went through some series uh, in my job that um, God taught me, says, don't worry about what they think. You worry about what I think. And so people said, you keep the Sabbath. It doesn't bother me. You tell them, sure. You keep the holy day, sure. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm ashamed uh, for some of the times that maybe I didn't stand up like I should have. <laughs> but we need to stop judging others because Christ doesn't. He says, don't judge others. He says we need in Matthew 6, verses 12 through 15, if you don't forgive others, I won't forgive you. So forgiveness is a, is a concept taught by Christ. Did he not forgive us? Think about some of the things we've done. But he gave us everything, forgave us everything that we've done and made us clean through his word. We understand that. So he says you need to be ready to forgive. He says you need to be willing to give rather than take. He says it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. I'm talking about a few basic principles that demonstrate God's love and how we need to be applying those principles in our life. 
For God is love, and we need to become gods, so we need to become love. Amos 8, verses 11 through 13 says, The time is coming that there's going to be a famine of the word. And I, I see that now happening in our nation. I don't know when we're going to fall as a nation. I don't know um, what they're going to do as far as the time is coming that we're not going to be able to preach the word. But I do know that while we do have time and while we do have the opportunity, we need to be soaking it up as much as we can, committing as much to our memories, uh, uh, actually putting it into our minds so that we can live by every word of God. So we know that God's word was given to us in these last days by his son. It's given to us so that we can become more uh, like him. So let's make sure that we follow God's word and let's try our best with the help of the Holy Spirit to follow in his footsteps.